Okay, so today we are talking about factors and we're talking about times. Um, I know I've heard at least from one person here questions about times like six weeks ago and now is the time where we're actually going to discuss how to work with time date objects in R because they are um, their own unique system. Um, and then factors as well are something that's really important that we'll want to be able to work with. So first we're going to discuss factors, then we're going to discuss times. Both of these have cheat sheets, so those are uploaded to the Canvas page. Um, for instance, here's the factors cheat sheet. You'll love that it's only one page, which tells you there's not as much information to learn about this. Um, but it's a really useful thing. You might not even know what factors are at this point. We're going to talk about it. And then the second one is how to work with date times the tidy way. So this is a tidy verse package. This is called Lubridate, and it's a nice two page long cheat sheet. But it, we will go over where you can find the information for the different parts and you'll be able to use it wonderfully by the end of today. So like I said, first we're going to talk about factors and then we're going to talk about time and dates. So basically we're doing two mini lectures today instead of one longer lecture on one topic. So the first thing is, what is a factor? So a factor is basically a special class for string characters in R. They exist in base R and what factors do is they're basically a categorical variable representation of a character value. So I'll show you more of what that looks like. Of course, we're going to get to that, but I'm just trying to explain basically as a variable in a data frame, you could have a variable that's strings and these are Twitter comments. If you have a string of Twitter comments, factor is not a very good class for that variable because you have unique values for each and every row. However, you might have um, username as one of the variables in your data frame and username you might have 10 different usernames you're working with and different usernames have made different comments that could be a good um a good contender to be a factor because factors are for categorical variables where you have multiples of the same thing and you're trying to say um first person said this one and you want to keep them kind of like cleanly categorical you could leave them as strings and we're going to see what will happen with that. This mostly affects when you're plotting and when you're modeling. So, you know, we've, we're not going to talk about how to model in this class, um, statistical modeling, obviously. We're not really going to talk about that, but when you're doing statistical modeling, I believe in the lab, I talked to someone about this. Um, you need to know what your base category is if you're doing a regression you can do that way using factors rather than just letting it be a string and it being coursed however R wants to course it. Also, when you're doing visualizations, which you will be doing um, and you have done, it affects the ordering in which the labels are presented. So by default, everything is alphabetical and oftentimes that's not what we want. So we'll go over what exactly that does. So in the back end, what factors are basically doing is it's putting a label. So let's say the, the variable we're working with is the species in the Star Wars data frame. So we've got humans, we've got droids, we've got whatever Chewbacca is. I forgot what he is. Um, so we've got these different kinds of species. On our side, we can see there's a Chewbacca, there's a human, there's a droid. A Wookiee, thank you so much, Mary. Um, on our side, it doesn't see Chewbacca, Wookiee, it doesn't see human. What it sees is one, two, three. And so it's having a label over the top of a numerical representation on the back end. And on the back end, it's always going to be one through however many categories you have. On our end, we can change which number Wookiee gets assigned to. If our things were droid, Wookiee, and human, they're always going to go in alphabetical order first. So in our case, droid would be number one, human would be number two, and Wookiee would be number three. Those were the only three options. We might not want that, and that's what this package is for. So let me get started and actually bring you through some coding to look at what this looks like. But hopefully I've given you a decent 
explanation of what this is and why we, we would use it. And then now I'm going to prove it to you in code. So we've got factors. Um, right now I'm going to, I've already loaded the tidyverse, but I'm going to do it again. So we've got the tidyverse and well, I already loaded it, so it's not going to show me what I wanted to show. But if I scroll up, I can see where I loaded tidyverse. And in my loading tidyverse, you can see I loaded something called four cats. It is four cats, so four categorical variables. It is a anagram of factors. Um, it's a very clever, clever name. And the package itself, I don't know if you caught on to this, but all our packages now have hex logos. So it's a hexagon shape. They make stickers, they're very cute. And this one is for cats. So you've got a box of cats, quite literally. Um, so we don't need to load four cats. So I can say library for cats, but it's already loaded. So I'm just gonna comment that one out. And then we're gonna be using the Gapminder data for this. So I'm going to load Gapminder. It's been a while since we've used this. So I think it's good to go back to it. And now let's actually play with creating a factor. So if I want to create a factor, this is just base R. I can simply say factor um, and then give it a vector. So that's supposed to be a C, not an X. And then I can give it different categorical labels. So let's do a very simple categorical label, happy and sad. So I can say, um, I'll go in the order of my screen. Sydney's sad. Um, Semyon is happy. Ash is sad and Raphael is happy. Um, so you two are the first, you four are the first four on my screen and those are the orders you got assigned, I'm sorry. So if I run this, um, we can see that it now says there's two levels, happy and sad. So we've got sad, happy, sad, happy, but even though sad occurs first because Sydney was sad and she's the first one on my screen because she's the last one who talked with her mic, Happy comes first because happy is before sad if we look, go by alphabetical order. If instead I do as factor, it just gets a little bit more semantic. And um, by semantic, I mean obnoxious, pedantic is the word I want. Um, sad comes first, so that is the first factor level. So when I say first factor level, that means that sad on the back end is a one, happy on the back end is a two. We're never going to be calling on those ones or twos, but the ordering does matter. So let me save one of these uh, and let me make a note. This is alpha order and this is order of appearance. We love R. Um, Besides, let me assign, yes. I just have one question. Besides like the difference in order, is there any like actual difference between these two functions or? To my understanding, not really. Oftentimes you're using as something to coerce something into numeric or coerce it into character. So as character, as logical, any of those sorts of things, logical would be like true, false. Factor though, you can use to create factors. And so I think that's the only difference between these functions. Um, I often just use as factor just because that's, because to coerce things into a new type, I always use as something. As factor is the first one that comes to my mind instead of using at, just factor. Um, let me save one of these to be called feeling, just so we can kind of look at what this looks like. So now I have an object called feeling and I can type in levels to see the different levels. So we've got levels of feeling. It's going to say there's happy and there's sad. Again, that's because we used the one that's in alphabetical order. I can do n levels to give me the number of levels. This can be important if you want to see how many different categories you have total. Um, or to make sure if you've dropped levels that they actually dropped. It's important. Now let's look at a factor that's in a data frame. Because that's one thing I think I've realized in this class. Sometimes when, we're when I'm teaching, I'll show you something outside of a data frame. But then when we get to a data frame context, we're kind of like, well, how do I work with this in a data frame? So let's focus on a data frame. 
I'm going to focus on the data, the variable from the Gapminder data frame called continent. So STR in this case stands for structure. It doesn't stand for string. It still confuses me. Um, and I want the continent variable. So this is more of a base R syntax here where we're saying here's a data frame. And then from that data frame, call on the variable called continent. I don't think I've shown the dollar sign syntax before. That's all you really need to know about it. You're just calling on a variable from it. And so if I call on this, this is basically taking the data frame, extracting that vector of that variable um, and making it into a vector instead of in a data frame. So we're going to get back to actual data frames in a second, but let's look at the structure. So it's a factor with it's got five levels with Africa, Americas, et cetera. And then it shows you the first few number representations of these levels. So I can do string. I can do levels also here. So Gapminder. What is it one? Okay, good. I must have done been doing an enter instead of a tab so that it was breaking lines. We've got continent. And you can see we've got all the levels, Africa, America, Asia, Europe, Oceania, alphabetical order. Like I said, every time besides using as factor makes it alphabetical order. Um, we can do n levels as well. See how many there are. There should be five because there's five labels here. And we can also look at the class. So we've got the class of factor. So again, factor is just a labeling mechanism for string variables. It makes them categorical. Um, if I want to know how many things are in each category, we know one way we could do this. If I want to know how many things are in co each continent, how many rows are in each continent, I can say gapminder and then count continent. And this should look very familiar because you've done things exactly like this before. Um, this isn't using any sort of factor syntax. This works on strings. It just happens to be that because this is a factor, this is showing us all the exact categories. If I want to um, extract this basically, have this extracted and look at it quickly for any factor, I can say factor count and then give it the gapminder dollar sign continent. So this is our first factor variable we're working with from four cats. So you can see it's factor because it's got FCT in the front. So like the string variables from string R that had STR in front, this says FCT, like fact or factor. Um, and then we're getting the count from each of them. This doesn't work though if we try to put it here. So if I try fact count, it doesn't like it because it's the first thing it's receiving when we do a pipe is it's getting the data frame and it doesn't know how to read that. So we can use this on a factor vector, but we can't use it within the context of a data frame. Ah, we are. So at least this hopefully feels familiar. You've done this before. This is how we can get the different levels. Now let's actually look at what we can do with the four cats package. Okay, I have an alarm going off. Don't know why. <laughs> so the first thing we're gonna learn here is how to reorder factor levels. Reorder factor levels. Actually, let me go in and put some labels so we know what we're going to do next as well. So we're going to first reorder factor levels, then we're going to rename factor levels. That's all we're going to do. It's going to take a few minutes, but we're going to work on different ways that we can do both of these things. So we're going to reorder, then we're going to name. So as I said, most of the time factors are in alphabetical order, but in practice, if something was low, medium, high, if those are the factor levels, those would be in a weird order. It would be high, low, medium. And that's like, that's not what we want, especially if we're plotting, we want them to be in the order that makes sense for the categories rather than an order that makes sense for alphabetizing them. So let's figure out how we can reorder the continent variable.
So the first way we're going to look at this is how to do it manually. So let me write manually. And this would be manually saying, I want um, Asia first or you know, whatever order we decide we want them in um, for our own personal, you know, we want it in that order for the plot because it looks better, et cetera. So I'm going to say gap miner, and I'm going to save this to a new data frame so we can pull on it in a minute. So I'm going to take the gap miner data and do a mutate. This is like the general syntax we're going to be using today. And I'm going to make a new variable because I don't want to overwrite my previous variable. I'm going to make a new variable named continent reordered. Just because that, that'll keep it clean. I'll know what I did. And here I'm going to use factor relevel. So factor is spelled FCT, factor relevel. And now here is where our new syntax is going to come into play. Our first thing we give it is the variable we want as the input. So the variable is continent. And then here, no, not continent reordered, just continent. Here is where we can give it the levels of a factor that we want. And so um, let me scroll up so I can see all of my levels. Let's say the first one I want is Asia. So I can put in quotation marks, Asia, then a comma. And then the second one I want, let's do Africa. The third one, Americas, then Europe. We've got some syntax here, weird. Got a closing parentheses, closing quotation mark, Europe, then Oceania. So these are the exact spellings as they are down here. The only difference is that we're putting Asia at the top because this is the total population for each continent and we're ordering it by total population and the only one that actually moves is Asia just happens to be Asia moves to the top because of the total population of the continent. So if I run this we can then look at levels gapminder dollar sign continent reorder and we can see now Asia has jumped up. So if I put these next to each other which I can if I just do continent we can see that the We've got Africa first, then we've got Asia first. Oftentimes though, we don't wanna be manually changing levels. If it's low, medium, high or something like that, we can. Um, well, one more thing I wanted to say about this function before I move on, sorry, is that we don't have to actually put the entire, all of them that we want. If we just wanna pull one to the front of the data frame, I'm just gonna copy and paste it because I'm only changing one thing. Because I'm only moving Asia, I can just put Asia because the rest of the or factors are going to stay in the same level. I want to pull out Asia and move it to the front. I can just call on Asia and it will do the exact same thing as it did before. They both work the same. This one's obviously a lot less wordy. I forgot the word that I wanted to use there. Um, so this one would be preferable. And obviously, I don't even have to do a line break there. That would be fine and we know that we're moving that to the front and usually you know unless you're changing the order of absolutely everything this works fine so if i don't want to order them manually i have another option and that's to let myself change the order based on something else so i could reorder levels by frequency So in this case, I don't want to manually tell it what order to do. I want to give it the order in of rows they have in the data frame, basically. So let me be more explicit. If I scroll up and look at this factor count, I want it to be sorted in the order of the number of rows. So Africa, then Americas, then Asia, then Europe, then Oceania. In this case, it would be basically the I want it to be in order of frequency of number of countries because that's how many rows there are slash observations. So I'm going to copy and paste this just so we don't have to spend time with me typing it. So I'm going to copy and paste this and I'm going to remove the back part. So here I'm going to do factor reorder two or freak, whatever, something like that, frequency. And we're going to do We're going to call on factor in freak for infrequent. And so here we will say continent 
and we can just leave it at continent. If we want it in order of highest to lowest or lowest to highest, we can change that by saying ordered equals true. Um, we can always look at the options as a reminder by doing question mark and looking at the help files. Factor and frequent by number of observations with each level largest first. And ordered stands for a logical vector which determines the ordered status of the output factor. We want it ordered, sure, let's do that. And then, I don't know why it's black. I don't feel like it's normally black in this theme. Let's run it and see. So we've got, I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of copying and pasting. I'm trying to get through a lot of material today. Hopefully that's okay and you all can keep up. We've got Gapminder. We've got now a factor of ordered by infrequency. So let's look at our original factor. And now we've got our ordered by frequency. The number of con countries goes by from Africa, Asia, Europe, Americas, and Oceania. If you remember, Oceania only had New Zealand and Australia, I believe. So that makes sense. And Africa has a lot of countries in it. It's a very big continent. So that makes sense as well. So frequency of observations, I guess I could say here. I'm trying to keep it nice and clear for everyone to remember. So that's how to do it by frequency. But one thing that's extremely useful is if we want to reorder this based on the values of another variable. So um, another variable is what I'll call it. And here we, especially if we're doing some quantitative analysis or we are plotting, we often want to rearrange our factor by the mean or the median of another variable, for example, life expectancy. We might want to reorder this factor by the mean life expectancy. And this time I'll do it by country so we can see it a little bit more explicitly. But it's the same overall outline. So I'm going to copy and paste and then do some deleting. So we're going to do a mutate first and then we're going to change those. So for Gapminder, we let's first look at the head of the levels. And I'll do that because there's a lot of countries in this data set. So we've got head of levels, and then I want to look at country. So the first few levels of country are Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, Angola, Argentina, and Australia. Let's reorder this so that it's in order of the median life expectancy. So what would be happening there is all of the, it's kind of like doing a group by country and then looking at the median life expectancy for each of those countries, which we've done in the past. So we would do a group by summarize, get the median, and then now order the factor by the ordered median. So whatever's lowest and highest. But we don't have to go through a group by and summarize to reorder this. We could just say mutate um, country, let's do median life expectancy equals, and here, here instead of doing factor infrequent or factor re-level, here it's factor reorder. And that is just saying basically reorder this based on another variable. Let me show you the image of this one in the cheat sheet. So on the cheat sheet, it's the bottom middle. So we're going to change the order of the levels. And here there's one factor reorder, and we're reordering the levels based on their relationship with another variable. So we'll do factor reorder of country, and we want country reordered by life expectancy. So let's run that, and then let me put this one here. So we've got the original Afghanistan, Albania, etc. And now if we order it in terms of life expectancy, we start with the lowest median life expectancy, Sierra Leone, Guinea-Bissau, Afghanistan, Angola, Somalia, Guinea, etc. We can change the function we want to use. Um, so I'm gonna now put this below. Oh, no, I guess I can copy and paste both manually. And then now let's say I want the max instead of the median. So I'm gonna change from median to max here. Median is the default function. So I didn't have to explicitly say it, but if I want the to call in the max function instead, I can just say max here. 
So Gapminder, country life expectancy, factor reorder. This time we want the maximum. So let me run that and then let me, as I said, I'm doing a lot of copy and pasting because everything's so formulaic today. So now we've got Sierra Leone, Angola, Afghanistan. It's a little bit different because now we've got Rwanda, Mozambique. They've changed a bit because we were looking at the maximum life expectancy that ever had occurred in that country. You can do this with any very any kind of function you would want. It just has to give one output. So you can't use range, for instance, because range, that function gives you two outputs, the lowest and the highest. Um, we also might want to do the opposite of this. So there's two ways we could do the opposite ordering. One way is by doing another function called let me do or opposite do and let me make sure I get the syntax on this right. I think it's factor reverse. Yes, factor reverse. So instead of low to high, I want high to low, and that can be used on any factor or inside the function itself, I can use dot descending equals true. Just one other function option we can do, I erase the X on that, that will do from highest to lowest instead of lowest to highest. So this is a lot of information. Let me show you now why we want to do this. And I'm gonna show you with a plot. So let me make a new chunk here. And I'm going to make a, a little data frame just called Gap Asia 2007, just so we have very specific data we want to call on. Gapminder, I'll do a filter year equals 2007, continent equals Asia. So we've got this. And now if I just go to plot this and I just want to plot, um, sorry, did you plot? <laughs> Stop talking and focus, Kelsey. AES X equals life expectancy, Y equals country. And then if I just want to plot a geom point, so I want a scatter plot of how this looks. We've got this down here. This is a semi useful plot. We can see which country had which life expectancy. But I promise you that the next plot I'm going to do is a lot more useful. So I could reorder the I could reorder the continent date the continent factor in mutate, or I can reorder the continent factor in my ggplot command itself. I don't have to do it in the data frame and make it permanent. So if I want to reorder country instead, I can reorder country here by saying factor reorder parentheses, and I want to reorder country by life expectancy because that's the variable that's on my x-axis. So if I run that, I think we can all agree that this is much more useful of a plot. We can see which ones are lowest, which ones are highest. The only way that this wouldn't be useful is if you want things in alphabetical order, but usually you know people can read through them and find the country that they're interested in. And this way you can find, oh, Thailand is very similar to Indonesia and to Korea. South Korea in this case. Um, this is much more useful. And so now every time we do plots, I'd much rather see this. If we're doing something that isn't with a factor on one side, obviously not. But if you have a factor, if you have a labeled access like this, if it's a year, keep it in order. But if it's not a year, if it's something labeled like country or name or I don't know, species, whatever we've done, this is a lot more useful. Yes, North Sam. Korea. I think it's North Korea down is there. Is that North South... Korea? Okay, thanks. Yeah. When they're labeled like Democratic Republic of North Korea, I obviously get them confused. Yeah, Korea Republic is right here. And that makes sense that they would be closer to Hong Kong and Israel. Thank you so much for correcting me, Semyon. <laughs> um, very useful. If you want it ordered by two different variables, you can also use a, another thing called factor reorder. Two. I'm not going to go over what how to do that, but I'll show you on the cheat sheet what that looks like. So you can do factor reorder two, where you reorder by two different variables. Um, this is often useful if, you know, like you, you can see here, we've got line plots and we want the labels to be in order. 
that's really like the most <laughs> the most useful that this is is so like in these categories these are ordered if you're ever trying to do if you're ever trying to make the labels in order for different facets of a plot i've tried to do this it's difficult but there are functions that make it easier and so if you're ever trying to do that just ask me how you can do it because there's a really good blog post from let me just write the name so you'll probably will define it if i tell you but julie silgi it's julie not julia julie silgi has a really good blog, blog post of how to make things in order on different facets so if you want you know by year you want a bar chart in order and you want them to be in different order for each facet which would make sense julie silgi has a really good plot for that it has nothing to do with the forecast package actually it's from a text mining package so just letting you know because it's something that is decently common a decently common need okay let's move on to the next section which is how to rename factor levels this one's a little bit quicker so we're almost done with four cats which is great let's look at our levels of gapminder continent again yeah, africa america asia europe oceania let's say i'm a crazy person and i don't want to call it oceania i want to call it australia i've seen the continent of australia or of oceania sometimes be called australia because it's its own continent and i mean this is all just human classifications that we've added on and we want to name it australia instead so if i take the gapminder data frame and i take the gapminder data and I want to do a mutate. I can do a continent. I'm gonna call it rename here, just so we're explicit that this is renaming. The function to rename is called factor recode. Um, and then I can take the continent variable and I want to rename, yeah, it's also called Australasia. That one's gonna be a little bit harder if I want Mal to combine Asia and Australia, but we actually could do that. There's a function we could do. I'm not gonna do it, but I'll show you where, where it is because it's something you might wanna do. Um, so let me finish this one and then I will get to that one. So I'm gonna name it Australia just for now. Australia equals Oceania. It's a little counterintuitive, the ordering here, because the thing in quotation marks isn't the new thing, it's the old name named factor. So the Oceania goes in quotation marks. The new label doesn't. I think you might be able to put quotation marks. I haven't tested it. Um, and that's all we need. So here we've got Australia gets renamed. So now we can look at levels continent and level continent rename. So let's look at both of those combined. Now instead of Oceania, it's called Australia. For collapsing categories together like let's say we wanted to make a new category called australasia that com that combines australia and oceania we could do that by using these changing the value of the vectors section and it is factor collapse i believe yeah it collapse levels into manually defined groups so i could say australasia equals asia oceania and that would collapse those two together right now if we're looking at continents this seems like something that is very specific and we wouldn't necessarily want to be changing but if you're working with survey data perhaps there will be times where there's different responses like don't know refuse that you might want to collapse together there could be different responses like um there's a happiness scale and it goes from very unhappy to very happy and there's a lot of different levels in between there's a lot of times where you want to be collapsing things together this is where this package comes into real, this package becomes really handy because before this, it was not easy and somewhat of a mess. So this is very useful. You will be using it on the lab and on the homework. Um, and hopefully you might find it being becoming useful in your final projects as well and in the future. So now let's move on to dates and times. And this is from the Luberdate package. So the Luberdate package is made by our studio. It's made by 
the makers of the tidyverse but it doesn't come loaded with the tidyverse i'm sure this is something that's like debated on whether they should do this but i believe you have it installed because it comes installed with the tidyverse but it doesn't come loaded so you have to specifically say the library loaded. i would be curious if it doesn't come installed um I would be a little bit surprised, but I think it is installed. We have to do library lubricate. Notice here when we do when we load lubricate, there's certain there's certain function that gets masked. So when a function is masked, that means that now if you just do set diff, which we've worked with in the past, if you just run set diff, it gets overwritten by the lubricate version of set diff. So you have to be careful what function you're calling on. This is something that in debugging a lot of people run into. This is also a reason why some people use lubridate set diff so they're specific in which package they're calling it from. I'm just letting you know that that's what this means here because intersect, set diff, and union are all things we've used in the past. Um, but we have the lubridate package. Let me know if you need time to install it, but we'll just move on. Um, in R, dates have been a pain in the past, and that's because there's so many different date types that one could load. I mean, you can imagine just like the five different ways you could write a date right now on a piece of paper. You could write um, Monday, March 29th, 2021. You could write 21-03-29. You could like spell out Monday. You could spell out March. You could just say M-A-R. There's like so many different versions and that's just in English of how you could write dates. That, of course, for data analysis has caused issues for decades. <laughs> um, there's kind of three main classes we can work with in R. Um, there's this thing, and I'm telling you this because I know people have come across it in the past. POSIX CT, it's not just R, it's this whole world of super fun things. We're not really gonna be working with this a lot, but this is the, let's save this here, portable operating system interface calendar time. That makes me like, just the way that this is capitalized makes me frustrated. So it's a way that Unix systems on your computer read time we can work with that, but actually Lubridate can work with that and Lubridate can work with other things. So let me show you a little bit of how we can first get like today's date. Simple as can be today. If I do today, it's going to give me today's date. And if I run the class, actually, let me not do this in the console. If I run class of today, parentheses, you can see that this is a class of date. This is an R command. Now, instead, let's do now. <laughs> We've got the date plus the time, but I think this is a POSIX command. Let's see, class of now. Yeah, this is a POSIX CT command. So fun. Um, they do such similar things. At least you can see here, this is quite readable. I think everyone here can read this sort of format where it's year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and then this is my time zone, even though that's not my time zone. Um, okay, <laughs> let's move on from this mess because I don't like it. And let's get into Lubridate on how we can actually read these. So the first thing we're gonna do is parse time which I'll explain what parse means. Then we're gonna extract values. Mm, no. Create time. And then we're gonna extract time. And then we're gonna do math with time. <laughs> This isn't that bad. I feel like I'm teaching it like it's this some scary thing that we all should be scared of. It's not. Um, I don't know why I'm giving that vibe. Hopefully I'm not giving that too strongly. Lubridate makes this all easier and that's why we're using it. Let's, let's think of a few different ways we can make a date. And let's do January 10th, 2011. 
So if I want to do January 10th, 2011, I'm going to put these in a vector. January 10th, 2011, I can do just like I said, January 10th, 2011. I could do 2011, 01, 10. I could do the American way, which would be 01, 10, 2011. Or let's just do 11 this time. That could be confusing. These are all different ways that I can represent the date of this date. Looper date is wonderful. So I'm going to say this is Jan 10, just to give it a name, because I want to separate it. We've got this now variable, with which, which is just characters. I'm not following my lesson, and I'm making this harder than it needs to be. Let me do these outside of a vector on their own. <laughs> okay. If we read this first one, we've got the month, the date, the year. So to read this with Luberdate, we would say month, date, year, M-D-Y. So if we do month, date, year of this, and we run it, we can see now Luberdate is able to read this. It's able to read whether I wrote January or whether I wrote Jan, whether I've got parentheses or backslashes, Luberdate can parse it. Parse means separate, basically. Okay, let's see. This one's year, month, day. So that would be year, month, day. Run that. Same exact output because it's the same date. It's just written differently. We're the ones who are not creating a function because these are already built in, but we're defining the function that is able to read that. This next one is month, day, year parentheses, run that, it's able to read it as well. Whether it's 11 or 95 or anything, it's able to guess that this is a 2011, not a 1911. If it was 1911, though, we would have to do more manipulation here. I Hopefully it's clear that month, day, year, it's the first letter of each of those, and it's in whatever order that they occur in the string. If we're working with times, we have a few more things that we have to define, but it's not bad. So let's, let me paste, eh, I'll just write them. So we've got one time, which is 10, 40, 10. So that's 10 o'clock, 40 minutes, and 10 seconds. We've got another time, which is the exact same, but it's 10, 40, 10, with spaces. Luberday does hour, minute, second. <laughs> no surprise because month, day, year, hour, minute, second. You'll notice M is lowercase in both of these, but it's able to recognize that those are different things based on the output around it. So we've got 10 o'clock, 40 minutes, and 10 seconds, or this is 10 hours into something. And then same here, hour, minute, second. It's able to parse that as well. And if I just had hour and minute, I believe HM works. But again, I'm going off the book. So 1040, yep, 10 hours, 40 minutes, and zero seconds because we just have the hour and the minute. So let me take two kind of more complicated dates and let's talk through them as a class. So T1. And let me paste this in the chat. Just just one yes. question. Um, put like zero talking about like hours. If you're doing like five minutes and 30 seconds, for example, mm -hmm. you have to put zero, five, and 30. Is that how it works? I think so. So the question is, is this talking about hour, minutes, and seconds of just like you put on a stopwatch and this is how many or, hours and Or would you left? put like MS before? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So hour and minutes from, yep, date, time, values, mm, Luberdate, there we go. So from Luberdate, is this asking, you know, duration? Like, is this time on a stopwatch or is this the time of day? Because if we're talking about time of day, there is no zero. There's no zero hour. It goes straight from midnight to 1 a.m. 
because midnight is like 24, but it's also zero. Time is weird. So if this is time of day, which it could be, because this kind of works both ways, there would be no zero. But if this was just like you said, um, a stopwatch, in, which is the other option, I could put zero in front of it, an hour, minute, second, and run that. That would work. It just knows it's 10 minutes. So let's see if there's a function that would just do minute, second. I don't know if there is. Let's do 10 minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah, there is. There is. So that works. You don't have to declare the hour. Perfect. I'm glad that worked. <laughs> um, OK, so now this T1, we've got 05-26-2004. We've got a time zone in here. And we've got a very specific time of day. Let's talk through what this could look like as a function. So what is the first thing that appears? A month and a day, and then the year. Yeah, so it would be MD. What's third? It's the year, so I could do MDY. Now, um, we're already getting some pre-filled options. We've got MDY, and then we've got minute, second, or sorry, hour, minute, second, millisecond. We've got MDY, HMS, hour, minute, second. This seems like it would work, so let's try to parse that. I have to run T1 first. So it looks like it par parsed it correctly. So we've got hour or year, month, day, which is the consistent formatting that they're always going to use. Um, hour, minute, second. It's ignoring the milliseconds, which maybe we don't want. Um, and then it's giving a time zone, UTC. It's not reading this time zone and assigning it. It's always going to assign UTC. And to my understanding, there's no way to get it to read the UTC, so we would have to manually change the time zone, which we're not going to talk about today, but there are ways to establish what the time zone is. We could do that. Now, T2, I would love to write the function day, year, month, hour, minute, second. Sorry. Day, year, month, hour, minute, second. However, that one's pretty weird, and R doesn't have that already that's not one that was pre-built. So we actually have to kind of build our own function. And I'm just going to preview this for you. It's called parse date time. There's more than one parse. If you do, if you look here, there's a parse date time from read R. That's not the one we want to use. We want to use the one from Luberdate. It's a similar function. It's from a different package. It's also tidyverse though. So it's just not the one we're going to be using right now but you may end up using it in the future when you're reading in files. So we're going to use part state time. We're going to apply it to T2, comma. And here is where we actually have to look at documentation because, let me make that a little bit bigger. We actually need to apply the order of what we want it to be read. So let me see if it gives us any more details. It does here. So in parse date time, we need to tell it what exactly we're trying to read. This is the only example we're going to have of this. If you're ever building one of these, you need to go to the documentation. Most people do not have this memorized. I definitely don't. I can half read it, but not really. Um, we're going to use kind of a abbreviated format to describe certain elements of this up here. So the first thing we have is the date. So I need to scroll through here and find date. Date is D. There's an explanation point here. I'm not sure why that is. So I'm going to say D. Next is the year. So I'm going to scroll down. It usually is the first letter. So Y, year with century. Notice capitalized is year with century. Lowercase is year without century. In our case, we have year with century. So we're going to use capital Y. The next thing is the month. So let me scroll up to M. Minute, month, lowercase m. Lowercase and capitals are important here. I'm going to put a space. Here I can find nothing that says time zone. I've looked for it. I don't find it. Um, there is 
a Z of signed offset in hours from UTC, but that's like minus 800, that's not time zone. It's very different. Um, but next we have hour, minute, second. Let's scroll up to hour, H, hour as a decimal number, yeah, H. Minute, lowercase m is month, uppercase m is minute. <laughs> and then finally, we've got second, second is uppercase S. So you can kind of see generally like the date tends to be lowercase and the time tends to be uppercase. Let's see if this worked. That looks correct to me. But you can see it's a little bit more work than just saying month to year, hour, minute, second. And then here, you know, if this wasn't UTC, you could probably say like MST. That's not going to be red, but then I'd have to define that the T zone. I think it's just TZ equals MST, something like that. And now you can see it's now in a different time zone. This could matter if you're calculating something between time zones, which we're not going to do today, but you might need to do it in the future. You never know what sort of job you're going to have. Um, I'm going to leave it there for those because that's so fun to do. That's parsing dates. Let's do some more practice. These ones, let's do them kind of quick because I think we'll be able to do them quickly. So let me paste some dates. I'll paste them in the chat as well. Let's go through them as a group. So D1, how can we parse that? By parse, I mean, what is the function that would read this correctly? So something like MDY, um, YMD, something like that. MDY for the first one. Yep, month, day, year. Let's run it. I didn't run these. There we go. I had one highlighted in case you were wondering what went wrong there. Great, MDY, that worked. What about D2? Y M D. Perfect. You guys obviously are getting it. All right, what about D3? I think everyone knows it. Yes, Sydney, sorry? Uh, DMY. Yep, DMY. I think everyone has gotten it and just doesn't want to volunteer anymore. You all are correct. Um, the next one would be month, day, year of D4. And that gives us two, so you're able to provide them in vectors as long as they're in the same format. And then D5, let's see. December 30th, 2014, so month, day, year, month, day, year, D5. Beautiful, we know how to parse dates. Times are basically the same thing. So now let's imagine that we wanted to create time. I know you all love the flights data set so much. So let's imagine in the flights data set, there's a column, because there is, that is the hour, the minute, the month, the day, the year, that exists. Um, <laughs> Ash put no, and I'm not sure if that's a response to the flights data frame or not, um, or if it was something else that was funny. So if I wanted to make a date time object, a date time object, which would look something like this, from those columns, we could. But first let's do a simpler example. If I want, to make a date from, let me save these as objects so it's a little clearer, 1981. The year, the month is the sixth month. And then the day is the sixth day, let's just say. So let's run year, month, twice, there we go, year, month, day. If I wanna make a time from that, I can use make date. Not make time because these aren't time objects, these are date objects. And then I can say year equals year, because these are saved as objects called the same thing as themselves. Month equals month and day equals day. Uh, From that, yes. a quick question. Which one is which? Since they're like 
Like if we were so, to name. That's a good question. Um, the first one's always the name of the option, and the second one's the thing I'm inputting. Okay, thank you. So I could save these with ones on the ends of them, and it would be like this. Yeah, so it's always in function syntax here. The first thing is the name of the argument, and then you say equals, just like if we did mutate, new column equals old. So there we go. Now we've got our nice new 1981 0606. Something happened that day, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we can also do this with our minute second. Let me just add on make date time. So we would have a time at the end of these. And then I can just type these out. So we could say hour equals 10, minute equals nine, second equals 35, I don't know. And now we've got our minute seconds and we've got a time zone. Normally, you're not going to be doing it within the context of just writing in dates and times, though. We're normally going to be working with data frames. No surprise there. So let's load our trusted flights data frame, which I'll make sure I don't use in future homeworks because I know your frustrations. <laughs> so we've got New York City flights. And then let me load my data. This is called flights. I need a closing parenthesis out of that. Now we can take our flights data frame. So I'm going to save it over itself. We've got flights. We're going to mutate. And then I'm going to make a new column called date time. And we can use the make date time um, function to add in the date time. So it's going to look here very similar to the one we just did, which would be year equals year, month equals month, day equals day. OK, that was weird. There we go. Enter. Hour equals hour. Min equals, and this time it's actually minute instead of min, saved in the flights data frame. And now I can do flights. Select date time. And I can preview what these look like. Now we have a much easier to use um, variable that has the exact dates and time. So now if I were to plot this, they'd actually plot pretty nicely because they would plot sequentially. Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> so I can do ggplot flights, AES. Mm, x equals date time and then here's one we haven't learned but i'm just going to throw it in geom freak poly which let's see exactly what that stands for that stands for histograms and frequency polygons so we're going to create a polygon based on the frequency and there's a type of one aesthetic thank you what you guys are here for to spell check me which is actually extremely useful i'm not being sarcastic and then i'm just gonna put bins 365 because we have 365 days in a year and now we can see in the year between 2013 and 2014 which this data is based on we can see kind of how the number of counts changes between different days <clears throat> we can also now filter our data frames a little bit easier. We have never filtered on date before, but now we can say flights filter. And we should be able to say date time equals year, month, day. And then here we can define exactly what our year, month, day is. So 2013, July 4th. Let's see if that runs. It did not, and that's because I had a feeling this we actually need to do as date. So even though this is a date, it's not reading it as a date. I'm not sure why. Because that is a date time column, right? Let's scroll up and see. Yeah, we've got a DTTM class, but I believe 
if I run this, it's going to be a different class. Let's see. Class. Yeah, so in this case, this is a DTTM and this is a date. And that's because this date time has a time component to it. So of course they don't match. So we need to say as date to get rid of the time information on as date. And you know, we could plot with this too. We could say ggplot. Hopefully you've all realized that the time zone got earlier for me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> date time and then plus geom creek poly again. And now we've got a sort of time of day representation of the flights that went out that day. So very few flights before 6 a.m. Most flights around 6 p.m. maybe, 6 p.m. and maybe 8 a.m. There's little peaks. We could do this now because we can use the lubricate functions. Let's make this a little smaller so we can actually see our code. Now let's work on extracting time. Just kidding, class is almost over. Oh, why do I keep doing this? Um, okay, next class for the lab, I'm gonna go over how to calculate, do math with time. For the extracting time, it's straightforward. So I think we can do that in a minute. I will paste part of the lesson here though, just so we have the key. So if I have a date time object, I can say year of, um, and then let's do a Y month day just so I can have an object. And then it would be like 2011, 11, 11. I can extract the year. I can also extract though the weekday for instance. So what day of the week was 11, 11, 11? It was the sixth day of the week, which is, I don't even know. There's a, there's an option you can do here to get it to display the actual day. Let's see if I can do that in the next 30 seconds. Label equals true. There you go. So the sixth day is a Friday. So 11, 11, 11 was a Friday. That's useful. We can also extract the day of the month, the day of the year. So what is the 50th day of the year? Well, we could figure this out. We could extract the hour, the minute, the second. These are all ways that we could pull out things from the date time, which we might want to do. I will leave it here. Um, Thursday, at the beginning of the lab, we're gonna do a little bit of doing math with time. Um, you could read through that part of the lesson ahead of time as well. I would enjoy that because then I don't have to cover as much of it. <laughs> um, you, as always, have readings for the week. The readings are chapter 15 and 16 of the book. So take a look at those, read through those. Those will go into more detail than I did. Yes, I can paste the list of arguments into the chat. Oh, that's the wrong one. Um, here's R, here's these. So as always, you have your readings. Take a look at those. I have no idea how many people are actually doing the readings, but they do go further than what I'm teaching. And I think it's important. And they do have other practice exercises that you can do before the lab. That would be great for you all to learn more R. So at least read through these because there's a lot to do with factors. There's a lot to do with dates. They're useful. Or, you know, one day in the future when you're like, oh, shoot, I have to work with a factor again. I don't know anything. You can read through it. Um, I will see you all on Thursday. We will work on our lab. Also, today, hopefully, your homework will be up. It's the next two week se section. So, your next homework is due next Sunday. So, I will have the homework hopefully posted today if you want to start working on the strings factor of that. Strings portion of that, not factor. I will see everyone Thursday. Let me stop sharing my screen and stop the recording. So, let me share my screen so that we can go over that. I'll just be working on the same document we were working on on Monday. And we're going to talk about how to do math with time. Basically, there's three very similar, but very importantly, different ways that you can think of differences between dates and times. There's the period, there's the duration, and there's the interval. 
there are important differences here. Duration is always going to be in seconds. And that's because duration is sensitive to daylight savings time and then to leap years and all of these kind of like little differences that dates and times have. Whereas period is going to go to its most general unit. So it's going to say like months and days. Um, and that's not sensitive to not sensitive to let's see, what should we call this irregularities in time. So I'm not going to go over intervals because they seem to just be like a kind of repeated of the other two. And I'm not 100% sure what the difference is or where I would use them specifically. So I'm not going to cover that. But if you want to know more about them, um, there's code in the lecture of how to learn more about them. I'm sure there are uses for them. But as I said, I don't see a use for them. So we're not going to use them. So first, we'll go over periods. So if I want to calculate just the total basically period of three months and 12 days, what I could do is I could say months. Oh, I'm going to have to load my packages first. So let me scroll all the way up and load. Well, there's tidy cats or tidyverse and gapminder. Tidy cats, that's a cute name. And then we're going to have to load Luberdate as well. There we go. Okay, so now we can. If we say I want three months and 12 days, we can use the days and months function to calculate a period, which is three months, 12 days, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. That's technically a period. Um, that seems to be the most useful way to use this. So we could add on, let's say, if we had a date, let me just copy this one from up here. I could take um, November 11th, 2011, and add on, let me save this as an object, let's call it P for period. I should be able to add on a period to a date to calculate three months, 12 days from that initial date. That's something you might want to do. Um, duration, though, however, is often in between two things that you provide. So let me give you a little bit more information on that. So usually I'm giving a sense of time, whether that's between two different times or I'm giving it one year. And duration is always going to force that down to seconds, like I said, because that's the lowest um, common denominator. So if I say D years, so the D in front of it is standing for duration, years is standing for years, and I say one, that's going to say how many seconds are there in one year? There's mm, 31,557,600 seconds, seconds in about a year. Um, I could do the same thing for D days. So in one day, there's about 86,000 seconds. D hours, notice these are all plural. 36,000 seconds in about one hour. Um, and then you can, you know, you can learn more about duration if you just say help duration class. I think that D on duration needs to be capitalized. So if I say that, um, these need quotation marks around them. We can learn more about duration. It's basically like a time span class, how much time spanned in this. Um, the important thing that I would like to use durations for, though, is to calculate time between two dates. So if we want to calculate the duration since the first single released by K-pop legend BTS, we could say we would have to know what today's date is and that first date was. So I'm going to say D1, or I'll call that BTS. BTS released their first single on, and I'm going to say month, day, year, because I'm, you know, telling it how to interpret what I'm going to type. And it was June 13th, 2013. So that was when BTS came out with their first single. And um, I'm just going to say D1 or D2 because I can't write today because that's the name of a function. And then I'm going to say today because that's the name of a function. So if I have BTS and I have D2, I can then 
calculate D2, which is today, minus BTS. If I do this, it's going to say a time difference of 2,849 days. And then if I say as duration of that, so this is giving us a period, I believe. But then I can say this with as duration to get the number of seconds, um, so about 7.8 years. Remember, the difference mainly here is that duration is sensitive to the irregularities in time, like leap years um, and all of the fun things like daily savings time. <laughs> time is wonderful. So that's all I have for the lecture today. It's really just that periods and durations because there will be a durations question on your lab today. So let me stop recording.